So hello, this is my presentation. Uh, it's healing landscapes uh, of wash traumas through wetland restoration and autoethnography and field philosophy. So as Justin was saying a little earlier, my name is Dakota Lane. I use she, they pronouns. Um, and I just earned my BS in environmental science. Um, I am the inaugural decolon uh, decolonial pedagogies uh, intern with the university, which essentially means I just look at how we can take out colonial logics and colonial arguments that have been instilled in our learning um, since America was founded. Um, I'm also a John Grant Fellow in Bioethics, which is how a lot of this research was funded. Um, I'm on the School of uh, um, Environmental Sustainability's DEI Committee, uh, which looks at how we can improve inclusivity in our department and in our school. Um, and then I also won uh, the Spirit of Lauderdale C Sustainability and Learning Award um, this semester, actually, for my work here. Um, and so my work here is really focused on the FCIP mission of Cura Personalis. Uh, Personalis. Um, and FCIP stands for Faculty Centers of Ignatian Pedagogy, right? And so one of the core tenets of Ignatian uh, philosophy just in general is Cura Personalis, this care of the entire person. Um, so when we're looking at learning, we're looking at learning through the entire person? How can we best serve the entire person through learning um, and through justice and through our service, right? In learning. Um, and for me, this really extends to water uh, just because of how Pope Francis has been such a recent advocate uh, for environmental sustainability as a whole, but very specifically for arguing that water issues are a right, you know? Um, a person will can't survive without water for more than three days. So by making sure that we have clean water um, or denying, should I say, a person clean water, we are really denying them of life. Um, and considering the fact that Pope Francis has been so um, vocal about how integral and important water is not only for us, but for the entire planet, um, it seemed like the perfect idea to look at how water is so important for the care of the whole person, especially as it relates to learning, right? Um, and so just think jo Chicago in general, you know, we've had so many water crises and Loyola follows suit of all these water crises. We've had um, urban flooding here at Loyola, but primarily in communities of color um, in the, uh, on the Chicago West and South sides, we've had um, rising lake levels and lowering like lake, lake levels. Um, so environmental planners don't really know how much water we're gonna get from year to year. Um, we have more lead service pipes than any city in the US. Um, and we have more lead, uh, more lead service lines in the US than anybody while also charging black and brown communities over um, far too much for what they're actually using. Um, and then we also don't have public bathrooms. There's just so many water issues that Chicago is facing. Um, and Loyola really does follow suit in a lot of those water issues, right? So my question was kind of how do we look at these wash issues that intersect with and how do they intersect with student wellness and, educa and education, right? And also how do we better understand like the wholeness of these community experiences, right? We're looking at the whole person, we should look at all of their experiences and how they relate to each other. Um, and so one of the major ways to do this, especially with water issues is through a method called participatory mapping. And so participatory mapping is essentially where you'll lay out a map and community members come and they plot on that map what's going on with water issues. Where are they experiencing an, uh, inaccessibilities to water? Um, where are things like bathrooms being closed? You know, where where is it water? Um, and so the community members can come in and kind of literally show where um, they're having problems with these issues, right? Um, and so this is an example of some of the maps that we did. Um, and so as you can see, we have all kinds of sticky notes of just notes on, you know, what's going on here, what's going on there, shaded in areas for maybe something's flooding over here, or maybe this entire building is not great, right? 
But the, uh, oh, you yeah, know, and so one of the reasons why this is so important, especially from an ethical standpoint, is just that ethics are not disembodied. And so when we're looking at these issues, we really need to be in the field of these issues and really looking at them. You know, it means nothing if I just sit across a computer and say, oh, you yeah, know, we have flooding issues. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong. You know, there's something wrong with that rather than talking to the people who are affected by these issues and saying, what are your concerns when we're looking at these things, right? Um, which just boils down to um, a technique called field philosophy, and it's just an ethical, um, an ethical philosophy method of doing participatory research, right? Um, but the problem with even looking at mapping as a whole, right? A lot of the problems that we're facing at Loyola are disproportionately affecting students and staff and faculty of color here, right? Um, and the problem where we're just doing simply mapping is that not everybody thinks about a map in their head. Not everybody has a map in their head. Some people think through pathways. Some people think through eras and times. Um, and so looking at the totality of these issues can be really difficult when we just lay a map out in front, when people might not even have that experience or know really anything, don't interact with maps in the way that everybody else does, right? or the way that, should I say, Western institutions have trained us to interact with maps, right? Um, and so for that reason, I wanted to analyze data through a geotrauma framework, which essentially just stands for geographies of trauma, right? So most people think of trauma kind of as you're stuck in the past, but what we're realizing as we study trauma more is that these traumas kind of leave the past open, that there's an erasure between now and then and there and here, you know? Um, it doesn't become that you are removed from a location, is that the location is kind of erased around you. And so it's indistinguishable this past and present, right? And so I took this approach just because that, again, not everybody looks at maps the same way. And so by kind of erasing the barriers between now and then, um, and here and now, um, excuse me, I meant there and here, excuse me, uh, we can kind of get a better picture of what brown and uh, black and brown communities are really experiencing when we're looking at these issues, not just as a map, but as a full on experience of what and limitations of what they can't and cannot uh, can and cannot do. Um, and so some of the findings that we're looking at when we're uh, talking to uh, community members is that there is high risk of flooding and poor drinking water quality. There's massive barriers to hygiene and environmental sanitation. Uh, so things like restrooms and people can't get soap, that stuff like that. Um, and then finally, there's a lack of moral awareness and inequitable prior prioritization on the hands of the administration. Um, so when we're looking at water quality issues, uh, especially if we're looking at flooding, we're just seeing it everywhere. You know, there are walkways that are flooded. Um, when it rains, dorms will flood. Um, and so as you see in the middle uh, photo, uh, not only has the bathroom flooded, there's water flowing from the toilet and flowing back into the tub, but that's also sewer water and wastewater. So now we're dealing with a public health crisis. Not only are we dealing with a public health crisis, we're also dealing with destruction of infrastructure, as you can see on the photo on the Right. Um, you know, water damage is a massive problem to any building structure and can cause integrity, building integrity issues. Um, and on top of that, just the water quality issue of, you know, with the sewer backups, again, public health crisis being, of course, you don't want to be exposed to wastewater. But more than that, we're seeing that students are facing molding in their apartments. Um, and that mold can cause um, can cause illnesses, especially if students have asthma or something along that, right? Um, not only are we looking at kind of like the, uh, the asthma symptoms, uh, not, excuse me, not asthma symptoms, but illness symptoms of having mold, we're looking at, okay, now you need to move, right? There's mold in your apartment, you need to move. Um, and so what we're finding is that university, the university does provide housing for those who are going through flooding and things like that, right? But they're moving them into dorms that are like quarantine doors for COVID-19. So you're also exposing the student to COVID-19 by moving them into these dorms rather than saying, go, you know, having an actual safe environment um, to live in. You know, you're 
continuously layering on um, risk exposures to multiple, multiple um, illnesses and hazards, really. Um, and even when we're looking at flooding, flooding itself is a hazard, you know. If you can't literally get to school because you can't walk through flood water, um, that's an issue too, especially for disabled students with like wheelchairs and whatnot. What are we supposed to do? Um, and that kind of goes in all into uh, barriers to sanitation just as a whole, um, is that not only are the students being exposed to all of these risk issues, right? But we can't clean it up ourselves either, right? Um, so not only is it like, you know, oh, I've been exposed to wastewater, let me go clean myself and let me uh, practice good hygiene. I can't do that. Why can't I do that? Um, and one of the reasons is that restrooms at Loyola are just out of order quite a bit, um, especially if we're looking at women's bathrooms. There were far more reports from women on stalls being out of or order than men's rooms being out of order, um, and that there's just simply not any sanitary supplies. Um, a bit of Loyola history, um, a st student organization on campus used to give out pads and sanitation products, right? Um, and finally, one for Loyola, to kind of take over um, and say, oh, we're gonna we're gonna start administering all these pads and these tampons and these supplies so that you don't have to. You know, it's not a luxury; it's a need. Um, but Loyola has not continuously refilled these um, these so students who are now relying on that as their primary source of pads and uh, pads and tampons no longer have access to that. Right. Uh, furthermore, there's just a lack of public restrooms in the area and water fountains in the area in general. So as we look to the map that's on the left side of the screen, that one little red dot at the very uh, like bottom right corner, that's the only public bathroom that we have anywhere near campus, the only one. Why is that a problem? Let's say I bring my family on campus. And after COVID-19, we already know how lo strict Loyola is with COVID-19 vaccinations um, requirements and making sure that everybody has government issue IDs, that et cetera, for safety and security reasons, right? I can't necessarily bring my family into a campus building and I'm going to have to use a public restroom, right? Not only that, but Loyola is next to the lake, right? Loyola is next to the lake. And what that means is it's kind of a privatization of the lakefront. And, but we're an open campus, so theoretically, community members should be able to use, you know, the lakefront as they, sh as they should. They're a Chicago resident. The problem is, is that if a community member says, oh, I want to access my community and ac access the lakefront in my community, I may need to use the bathroom while doing that, right? And now I can't do that. And not only can I not do that, especially as we're looking towards things like the summer where everybody's out on the beach and everybody wants to be by the lake and whatnot, police are changing their surveillance routes um, and their uh, and their routes to make sure that, you know, to police and make sure that the community is safe in theory. Uh, but what that means is that we're getting a far larger contact for those communities of color who aren't Loyola students um, or Loyola affiliated, um, as well as just people of color who live in the area, you know, we're having a far larger contact when the only public bathroom in the area is that one and the police are also hyper, um, hyper policing that area, right? So we just have that way more contact for something to potentially go wrong as well. Um, and then finally, we also just on campus don't have that many gender neutral bathrooms. We don't have that many family bathrooms, uh, which prevents pregnant, uh, pregnant students, faculty and staff from being able to bring their children and actually care for their children or not pregnant, excuse me. Uh, 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 students, staff, and faculty with young children, excuse me, and babies who, you know, I still need to bring, I still need to work, um, I still need to go to school, but I have a child and I need to feed them, and there just aren't places for that, as well as looking at gender neutral bathrooms, which are a massive security issue for gender nonconforming people, uh, because oftentimes we are said that we're supposed to, sometimes we are said 
that like um, and feel better in spaces of our own gender, but people of our own gender don't always accept us and may use violence against us in either bathroom. So having gender non-conforming spaces and gender neutral spaces are really important for that. Um, so these are just several of the risk factors kind of Loyola layers on on top of the flooding. It's not just oh, the dorm is flooding and now my property is damages, my, uh, my dorm is flooding. I can't get access to clean myself for multiple to a multiple of reasons and I'm being exposed potentially to violence because I can't get to sanitation or health risks because they've moved me into an unsuitable location. Right? Um, and so what this really looks like is an inequitable prioritization of, you know, university services and whatnot, you know, a lot of students have said uh, that they feel the university is kind of greedy with their tuition in terms of, of they don't necessarily feel as if um, university money is going where it needs to be going. Um, especially when we're looking at the growth of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs at the university, right? So it's well known that um, the Student Accessibility Center is understaffed, right? But we just got an Office of Black Student Excellence. And so it kind of pits these organizations against each other when there's only such a large budget for diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, processes, right? And the students need that support, right? Not only is it kind of an equitable prioritization in terms of funding, it's just maintenance um, that they're not really thinking about, you know? We just built a dorm on cam campus called St. Francis Hall, um, which is an honors dorm. And it's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. But why can't everybody have a gorgeous building? Why are we, why do we continuously build new dorms and we don't update the infrastructure and old ones, um, especially as we're looking at buildings such as Dumbach, which is really, really old. Um, and the water filters aren't replaced in that building. We're not, we're just not doing maintenance on anything for that matter, you know? Um, and not only are we not doing maintenance on the buildings, um, the main reason is that the university is very disjointed. Uh, so again, if I'm a student and my dorm's flooding, right? Who do I tell? I tell the people at Res Life, my RA, my RD, um, the people who live in my dorm. I, I tell somebody in residence life about the issue, right? And residence life is the um, campus agency that handles all the dorm kind of stuff. But I tell I tell them, right? And Res Life goes and tells facilities, the facilities department, to send down an engineer, right? And the engineer eventually comes and fixes the issue, right? That's where it stops. It doesn't go anywhere else from there. It doesn't go anywhere. There's nobody, it's not, oh, we are looking at seven people experience flooding and it's only been a month. No, where it doesn't, it stops literally at the engineers coming out to fix everything, right? And even when we're looking at departments like the Office of Sustainability, which look at how campus is flooding and try to figure out solutions along with our engineers over at JJR, um, which is an instrument and uh, excuse me, an environmental consulting firm, which helps, you know, plan all the sustainability initiatives on campus. Uh, but even as the Office of Sustainability knows about all of these issues, they don't necessarily know the intimate details of, okay, students, are not only experiencing flooding, they're experiencing mold. We don't know that students, how students are getting sick, how often students are si getting sick, what hospitals they're going to, can they afford to go to a hospital? So are they using Loyola's uh, health um, health services? Are Loyola's health services getting overwhelmed because of flooding? They simply don't know that information either, right? And finally, we're looking at the fact that a lot of Loyola agencies don't have power to approve their own policy changes, right? So looking at, for example, SAC, the Student Accessibility Center, a lot of students have proposed, oh, I really need, I could use accommodations uh, to help get through the fact that I basically missed two weeks of school because I was sick because of mold, because of Loyola, right? And SAC says, okay, well, we need a doctor's note, we need something, that, et cetera. Or maybe they're not even able to administer um, accommodations because it's a temporary illness, right? And theoretically, you're supposed to be getting, uh, you're supposed to get better. But what am I supposed to do in the meantime? And unfortunately, SAC themselves can't approve that. 
they can't approve that kind of policy change to give students excessive uh, to give students accommodations, even if they feel that this is highly justified. Um, so we're having all these kind of levels of not only just you know the flooding is the issue; it's also the university was just simply not structured to handle environments um, like this. We weren't we weren't designed to handle uh, diversity and uh, a diverse group of students who might be experiencing multiple issues around the same uh, the same central focus. You know, um, as I've said before, there has been a wide range of experiences, obviously, as we include more diverse students into this project um, who are saying, you know, again, it's not only flooding, it's the fact that, you know, I feel unsafe when I'm using the bathroom, you know, things like that, which most, uh, the majority of students, meaning uh, white or cisgender or heteronormative students, do not experience. Um, and so the, uh, so the Loyola structure is just simply not designed to look at our issues or to look at just issues of flooding in general, um, which is the main problem, right? So how do we rebuild resilient wash securities? How do we make sure that everybody has access to sanitation, water, and hygiene, right? One of the best ways to do that is just simply west wetland restoration, right? So wetland restoration, for those of you don't who don't know, is just simply turning the landscape back into that of a wetland. So things like swamps, marshes, and maybe not on that scale, obviously, because <laughs> uh, we don't necessarily, we already have a flooding with, uh, problem with flooding. We don't want to flood campus even more. Um, but turning back Loyola's landscape to that what it was initially before. Um, and that means we are investing in campus flooding resilience. That means that we're enabling ecosystem agency and health um, and that we're empowering existing social infrastructure, right? So what does this really look like? Uh, so for flooding resilience, this means that we're gonna change the hydrology of the area through soil replacement, meaning we're gonna change the way water flows through our environment by changing the soil. We're gonna create native foredune rain gardens. So a, for, a, native, uh, so a foredune is essentially the grasses that live on the edge of lakes and sands and things like that, right? And a rain garden is a landscape that absorbs a lot of water very, very quickly. And so it can get the water into the ground very fast so that the rest of the area doesn't flood, right? So we're gonna create these kind of rain gardens that get water into the ground very fast, but do it in an environment that's suited for plants that like to live in sand dunes, essentially, right? And things are in more drainage oriented or sandier soils, right? Um, and finally, that means that we're developing residence hall repair and evacuation plans and just building replant, uh, building uh, repair and evacuation plans very generally, right? Um, and so when we're looking at actually putting in these four dune structures, right? So we're looking at kind of getting in between where you see the trees and where you see the uh, part that says precipitation, right? We're kind of looking in that area. We would like to put in, maybe replace the top eight inches worth of soil with sand uh, so that the water can more easily drain and get to uh, a place where it's held in by the clay soils that are underneath what sand usually has. Um, and so the next goal of our restoration project is to enable ecosystem agency, which essentially just means we're going to let the environment do what it wants to do. Right, uh, the ecosystem has been doing what it wants to do for millennia before humans ever existed, um, and so we should try to help it do that. Um, so, if we're looking at replanting native foredune structures, um, that means that we're including multiple types of grasses. So, the one on the far right is called marum grass, and it likes very, very sandy, like beach dry soils, it can take in water when the lake uh, comes up and absorb all that water, but it likes sandy soil, right? The one all the way on the, excuse me, the one on the right is the one that likes, uh, the one on the left is the one that likes sandy soils. The one on the right, on the other hand, is milkweed. And milkweed likes just water generally, 
but it likes more clay soils that are going to hold on to the water compared to sandy soils, which just allow it to drain all the way through. And the uh, one in the middle, which is um, blue stem grass, just likes, you know, it, it can go either way. Um, but making sure that we're planting all of these plants and kind of letting the environment decide, okay, I would like to look a little bit more like this at the moment. I don't think I can really do um, a full flooded wetland or seasonally flooded wetlands landscape, or maybe actually, I don't really think I wanna be sand at the moment can really help build resilient ecosystems just because it's doing what it wants to do, you know, and we're not dictating you need to do this. Um, and this has been uh, wildly tested as the rewilding me method, rewilding, excuse me, method of restoration, uh, where at Chernobyl, actually, uh, because there wasn't any much human interaction, they couldn't get into the area. Um, to really monitor and continuously do, uh, continuously alter the environment to what the restoration plans were for that area, just because of the high amounts of radiation, right? Again, this is Chernobyl um, and the, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, Chernobyl, right? Um, but because they couldn't get in and do that so often and have this kind of agency over the environment, they, were able to, the environment was just able to go in ways that it wanted to go. And so it kind of just put the wetlands that were there back um, because it wanted the wetlands there and the animals that wanted the wetlands there wanted it back, you know, it just, it just put itself back. Um, and so really thinking about allowing our environment to essentially correct itself is a big and major part in the restora uh, restoration process. Um, and then finally, we're looking at developing social infrastructure around uh, these wetland systems. So teaching students and staff restoration techniques uh, so that they can go in and start the restoration process and then let the environment run with it uh, to curb, uh, to curb uh, flooding. Uh, that means that we're authorizing classes to develop and implement and manage uh, campus landscaping plans and that we're using the environment to embody uh, um, critical theories of race and gender and the ways that the environment really plays into how we interact with it. So for restoration techniques, personally, as an SES student, I've never been a part of a, um, of a grassland burn. Um, and grassland burns are just where you essentially set a field on fire to burn back um, overgrowth of plants, right? Um, and that's something I've always wanted to do because it's such a natural part of grassland ecosystems and it also requires so much training. So getting a head start on those techniques are really important. However, we don't do that here. Um, some of the Chicago land parks, the Chicago Park District actually started doing that, but we haven't really heard all too much of like when they're gonna do it, are we gonna, can we be involved in whatnot? Um, and so we simply don't know restoration techniques that are becoming um, really important for us to know and that people are doing as we move into the job market. Um, and we just simply don't know them. Um, and so looking at this restoration project, a major thing that we can start doing is teaching students how to plant grass species um, rather than, because uh, grasses usually don't like to grow from just seeds. They like to kind of grow. Um, they usually kind of like to grow more asexually and through like little cuttings and whatnot, and just they'll spread from there. Um, but considering the fact that a lot of students at Loyola would like to stay in the Great Lakes region in terms of doing restoration work or grassland restoration work around the Great Lakes region, um, it would be really impactful for us to start teaching students how to actually plant these uh, plants that they will one day probably need to, right? Um, and then also just we can do this on campus you know so this is a grain garden that's in front of the church on campus i can't remember the name uh but this is one of the rain gardens and so restoration club actually started uh helping out with kind of the campus landscaping um and implementing all of these rain uh the few rain gardens that we have on campus right but we can expand it there's no reason why we can't um and so having students 
be involved in kind of the camp, campus landscaping process not only uh, help students learn how to take care of the environment for future jobs and whatnot, or even not for future jobs, even if you're just here, you know how to take care of your own backyard, uh, but not only would that help students kind of learn and teachers kind of get, um, have access to an, another amenity to teach students with, it would also take a lot of the burden of campus landscaping off of facilities so they can focus on maintenance problems such as plumbing that students aren't going to learn in these programs, right? And then finally, we can really start to look at why these problems existed in the first part. You know, a major problem, as I said, is kind of the lack of awareness of these issues and the fact that the university just simply isn't structured to look out for these issues, right? Um, and so teaching faculty, especially who are teaching the course and kind of showing students how this happened and was reproduced, as well as the administration, how this was reproduced, is very important. Um, and one of those ways, especially since we're looking at wetlands, is looking at uh, critical ambivalence theory, which is my kind of niche and my get to and uh, really drives me, uh, which essentially looks at how colonial systems and colonial logics introduced contradictions that hindered the oppressed people. So for example, colonial logic said that black and brown people were beast-like, we were closer to animals, um, but also said that we should be civilized and then try to civilize us. And it doesn't make sense to civilize animals if they're going to be animals. So colonial logics have a, lo have a long history of kind of racializing structures like this in terms of saying, oh, we don't want you in our community, so we're going to send you to wetlands to live on, right? But you're encroaching on that land that we also need to redevelop. And that doesn't make sense. You didn't want us here. And so you sent us to the wetlands. But you also told us that we're encroaching on wetlands uh, because you need that for redevelopment. And so this has been a big problem in Southern Philly very specifically. And as a matter of fact, um, Tanya Suchler and uh, Max Melstrom here at the university uh, did a paper on environmental gentrification that was looking at this exact problem of looking at how Black residents are kind of viewed as encroaching on possible development, uh, possible um, property that could be redeveloped rather than recognizing you sent them here. And so the question then becomes, am I black because of my skin color? Am I, uh, am I you know, a race because of my skin color? Am I, or am I a race because of where I live? Because I live on these degraded wet landscapes uh, that you all sent me to, is that the reason why I'm not now classified as black? You know, um, And so looking and teaching uh, teaching uh, professors about these structures um, so that they can better educate their students on how these uh, structures are reproduced and continuously uh, and, content, and continue to be reproduced in various fields, um, they can be better aware of how they are implementing wetland restoration strategies to make sure that we're not pushing out black and brown communities and to make sure we're not racializing landscapes. We're not queering landscapes and saying, oh, you're weird because your uh, life cycle, other species life cycles are different, you know? We're not imposing any bias on the environment or the people who live there, right? Um, and so that's basically it. Thank you so much for coming. Are there, uh, I, I, I'm here for questions for sure, I'm, yeah. Yeah, congratulations, Dakota, again, on such a great presentation uh, and this kind of culmination of your work. Um, if you could uh, go ahead and stop sharing the screen uh, so that yeah. you can get the full thing back. Um, so yeah, this is the point where we're gonna open it up to uh, a few questions if folks have um, those or kind of comment on that. I'll go ahead and kick us off with, um, one, I have a couple questions and I'll pop back in and forth. Um, but 
the first one is you talked about it a bit, but I think it might be really helpful um, for folks. So you talked about the challenge, like what a challenge it is to look at the totality of traumas um, because of the different ways that people process information. Not everybody looks at maps the same way, right? So uh, one of the things I want you to just kind of explain a bit is what the exercise, the participatory mapping exercise actually looked like for those who weren't able to to participate so they kind of have a sense of what we were all doing in the room how we you know how we put those uh, sticky notes on what those actually meant if you would for sure uh yeah no i it's a lot to remember and i don't do notes very well uh, <laughs> but you know so it really is like you sit in a room and you say here are the problems where are the problems um and I specifically led the groups in circles. Um, so circles are essentially where students and uh, anyone, anyone who's invited is sitting around in a circle. Um, and the original story of it is just indigenous leaders used to put everybody around the circle to, in theory, uh, level hierarchy structure so that everybody is equally represented because you're sitting in the circle, right? No one's at the head and no one's at the tail, okay? Um, and so we talked in these circles and let group uh, and, you know, discuss kind of the ways in which we started with weather and relating ourselves to the environment um, so that we could start really looking at how we see ourselves in the environment, right? Um, and then we moved from talking about weather and how we see ourselves in the, to the, in the environment in turn, and then to um, how we are seeing what's uh, the environment kind of in ourselves and the experiences that the water um, we're having with the water is in ourselves. Um, and so for people who didn't really under, uh, for people who didn't completely see the world as a map, sometimes we would just talk about directions that they used to get to campus and say, oh, I walk down this street and I turn and I look and there's this puddle right here. And then I can mark that on the map so I know where it is, but I'm still noting the directions and seeing kind of how they kind of visualize this pathway and where their attention is as they're walking, um, as well as some people drew landscape pictures, you know, um, in terms of just here's the landscape, here's my literal point of view rather than looking top down. Um, some people talked about the way they felt when they were walking through the environment. Um, so, you know, we were just trying to get people to realize themselves in the environment rather than just, oh, the wa the bathroom is here and this bathroom is closed, you know? Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, as you were talking, it struck me with how you're, at the same time you're taking this different information from people, you're synthesizing it onto the map as we go. Because a lot of people, like, for example, my brain doesn't work in a kind of map-like way, but understanding how I'm walking through something, you're able to place that and mark it in a, in a way that makes sense for this kind of work and for the data you were trying to get, which is really impressive. Um, so we can open up to other questions. Uh, if folks have other questions, if you could use the hand raising function, uh, that is just in the reactions button at the bottom of the thing, or just raise your hand. All right, Federico, go ahead. All right, uh, congratulations, Decora. That was a great, uh, great work, and I'm happy that I could attend it. I like the the signs behind it. You know, uh, I also like the uh, identifying the specific problems of Loyola, which are a lot, uh, but I also like the social impact. That's very important. So I have uh, just two questions. The first one is that um, if you were to, to talk to, you know, to people who made decisions at Loyola, which one would you talk to? Which one would you prioritize? Which, which one will, will be your priority? You know, the social aspects, the infrastructure aspect or the sign aspect. And my second question is that, uh, is there any follow-up or it, it would be, is there any follow up on your thesis work? I mean, like, uh, is, is the plan is that to put I mean, together a proposal? Uh, I know that it's Loyola internal, inter, internal intram, in, in, intramural, intramural funding sometimes goes around throughout the year. Uh, I don't know if that's one of the goals, uh, especially where Justin works in that office. 
to get this, you know, <clears throat> to be actually put in action. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that question. So in terms of priorities, um, I don't necessarily, in my mind, it's all the same problem and I'm just shifting the camera uh, to get kind of how we're looking at these different issues, you know, uh, the access, the, uh, the poor access to sanitation is the same problem as flooding, uh, because flooding causes poor sanitation. Um, so it's really for me about how I shift the camera. And so I think that in talking to administrators, I would like to, I think sharing that would probably be my priority um, is helping people to understand that this isn't multiple problems, uh, multiple problems that are kind of not necessarily relate, uh, not necessarily disconnected, but are definitely related, uh, but more that it's one problem that has manifested itself in multiple ways. Um, and so I think that, I think your question was asking also who would it go to? Um, I definitely want to talk with facilities a little bit more about their management strategy uh, because facilities as an agency has a little bit more um, agency in terms of what they can approve and what they can't approve. Um, but I also think that, especially like talking with Aaron Dernbach, who is the Director of Sustainability at Loyola, um, is always a pleasure and always very helpful um, with planning these things, even if he can't completely approve it, because he can say, oh, uh, this is the specific pathway that we need to get this approved, and this is not the specific pathway uh, that would be helpful for this project, you know, kind of thing. Um, but I definitely think speaking a little bit more with facilities would be helpful, especially since a lot of these are maintenance issues. Um, and then I also think that kind of changing the culture um, that our board of trustees and our president's uh, cabinet is, you know, um, creating is also, you know, in terms of they're very, very focused on funding right now, which is great. That's wonderful. The university needs funding to continue running, but having more of these conversations about budgeting um, and what's going where and how this will really make Loyola um, an excellent school is also a big priority for me. Uh, oh, and then I think your last question was kind of where does, you know, go a little bit. So FCIP will be publishing this over the summer, um, at least the confidential information from it they'll be publishing. You know, I can't say, you know, Loyola in uh, nature, um, but I would like to write, um, I would like to publish a commentary probably, possibly in nature, or like, I don't know, maybe, um, Oh my goodness, what is it? Radical is a radical geography um, journal that's a lot of my research I took from there. Uh, but publishing in either of those of just a commentary of how we are viewing kind of these issues would be wonderful. Does anyone else have another question for Dakota? Okay, well, folks are thinking I'm going to go ahead and ask my other question, which mm -hmm. was, um, so and you got into this a little bit, but I just want you to kind of um, pull into it a lot more to make the connections really clear, right? So um, yeah. we at FCIP are the Faculty Center for Ignatian Pedagogy, and primarily we're a teaching and learning center, right? And specifically providing support to our faculty, staff, and graduate students, the educators at Loyola, on how to best prepare and educate their students, right? And to kind of right. have that sense of learning. So within right. this, like, can you go into about how these issues, right, that you were talking about, how do those issues directly impact and affect student learning and even the ability for our faculty, staff, and graduate students to then educate, right? So what, what are some yeah, real right. ramifications of that? Yeah. Right. Um, and a lot of this is just, you know, in my thesis, um, which is too long to actually present the whole thing. But, um, you know, when we're looking at this, mind you that, student, how are you supposed to do homework if your dorm is flooded? Where are you supposed to go? Not only is your dorm flooded, but the IC is flooded as well. Not only is the IC flooded, but the IC in the uh, 
Cudahy Library archives are flooded. So how am I supposed to access educational materials? Um, so it has massive implications, not just, I think, for professors to start realizing the capacity of their students while we're looking at these issues. Um, but also on the teacher kind of side of things, you know, really looking and saying, okay, so I'm seeing that my students are having troubles with this. Why are we having troubles with these issues, right? Um, and kind of going back to that critical theory of how do, again, how did we get here? How do colonial logics play in this? Um, and how can I not to reproduce kind of those logics to uh, potentially marginalize students who are from a lower economic bracket, who are, are not used to Western forms and understandings of knowledge um, and other things like that. You know, how do I best not marginalize students through learning about these issues and the ways that colonial logics and technologies have manifested in flooding? Awesome, thank you. And uh, just for our uh, audience here um, to kind of even extend that example a lot. So for example, a very general way that um, FCIP can employ a lot of the information that Dakota is talking about is that, so say for example, you're an educator, all right, and you have a couple students who seem to not be able to get work in. They seem to not be connected in class, right? They seem to not be doing that. So it's a matter of one, how you interact with that student to figure out what the issues are, right? And then you figure out the issue is, well, they can't because they're focused on you know, flooding or they have health complications because of mold or because of these kind of things, right? So then how do you, one, what the work that, um, part of the work that we can do is how do we best uh, prepare educators for these type of specific issues, right? Or to be able to recognize that these wash issues might be a part of the, um, the situation that's happening. So then they can better prepare a plan for that student to proceed with their education to continue uh, going, or they can prepare alternative plans that maybe, you know, as happens, a lot of classrooms can get flooded. A lot of spaces like that um, can have a lot of these issues. So how do you, how are you, we able to prepare our educators to pivot, right, and to be flexible and to be able to attune to these particular kind of issues? So yeah, thank you, Dakota. Right. Yeah, no, I also have something to add on to that. Please, it's yeah. just our educators, especially if we're looking at wetland restoration strategies, right? That is such a profound, and having land to do that is such a profound resource to do that, you know? Uh, it's not only just, you know, if a student can't necessarily write an essay um, about restoration techniques, but they can show that they know how to do it because they're in the field. That's, you know, looking at alternative strategies to making sure that students have, you know, get what they need out of it, you know? And just using kind of these courses and that infrastructure uh, uh, to best serve and teach students as well. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much. Are there any last or lingering questions? Yeah, go ahead, Marlene. Hi there. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Dakota. It's a pleasure to meet you. I almost feel like um, it's a shame we're not going to overlap, <laughs> but I'm glad I got to see you today and learn from you. I am new here. I am new faculty at SES. My name is Marlene Lito Millan, and I teach the ecology laboratory here. And so I loved listening to you and your ideas. And, and what I can say is I, I, I will definitely take them into consideration as, you know, I, I, I think about ecology laboratory into the future. Um, and I just want to point out that I mean, I, your idea about restoration and, you know, the idea of, of learning how to seed grasses, I think there's a, an important decolonial element to that, which is that of relations. It's all, almost like you're, you're calling for the restoration of relations, right, mm -hmm. to place, to be able to do that directly and having students involved. I think it's a beautiful um, approach and idea. So, so thank you. I just wanted to thank you for for what you shared today, and and it's really been a pleasure to 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 learn from you. And I'm sure others in in here in your community feel just um, as lucky and blessed to to have have you. So thanks. 
thank you so much. Yeah, no, trust me, I've heard your name before. Um, I was talking with Greg Palmer downstairs and he was like, oh, this is a person you should probably know. And I was like, I have never would like to have never seen her in my life. Uh, but it's so lovely to meet you here, especially, uh, you know, hearing from you so much. Um, but you're absolutely right, especially when we're looking at, you know, um, Ecology Lab, that's really what I'm thinking about is, you know, step, uh, the step classes is what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Ecolab. I'm thinking about the fact that, uh, you know, in Brian's Restoration Ecology Lab, did we pull together these type of plans with full timelines and everything? Yes. Are we going to do it? No. Um, and so step classes and very specifically step classes have um, kind of stopped from becoming these multi-semester projects into one offshoots of, you know, po let's uh, put posters around campus, which is, again, needed, absolutely. Uh, but it stopped becoming the biodiesel labs that we have normally seen, you know, biodiesel, our biodiesel lab, which is produces um, the soap on campus and the biodiesel gas for our shuttles, for those of you who don't know, started off as a class project uh, for climate change stuff. Um, and we really Need to get kind of back on the train of really making step a pathway to implement some of these things um and i also love the fact that you brought up grass because i am black i am native um and looking at you know that's literally braiding squeak grab uh robin wall camera you know that's literally her um and that's the point is that not only are you learning kind of these colonial theories in class you're practicing them in person it's not just oh i can see how landscapes are racialized it's no i am planting the grass i am possibly racializing something in that moment i am possibly oppressing something in that moment and living with that being you know it's not just oh i'm conceptually thinking about it as a lot of philosophers do it's this is embodied i am in this space i am going to be in this space and i'm going to submit myself in this space yeah Absolutely. Thank you so much for that comment. Yes, thank you so much. Are there any uh, other lingering questions or things before we wrap up today? I'll give folks a, a little bit of time to pull that in. Yeah, yeah. Bridget, go ahead. Hi there. Thanks for... Um... I'm, I'm sorry I'm off camera, um, but I this was so phenomenal. And so I just really wanted to congratulate you and then just kind of share that on uh, for another voice from the faculty center um, that what you've been doing I think really does have implications for the work that we do and I'm hopeful that we will find ways to integrate this we have our new faculty scholars coming on who are going to be um, dealing with sustainability issues and hopefully this can be part of their orientation to the work is to be exposed to your work. Um, and so I just wanted to publicly thank you, congratulate you for the work that you're doing, but thank you also on behalf of the center for how the work that you have been doing is going to continue to inform how we do what we do um, going mm -hmm. forward and that will live past um, your amazing time here. So. Um, thank you so much. It's it's a gift that you're giving to the whole community. So we're really proud of you. Thank you so much, Bridget. So Bridget is our co-director and uh, an amazing director. Um, I cannot thank you enough for all of your support throughout uh, my time here. Um, I really can't. I really can't. Uh, but yeah, no, I would love to see. It really does have implications, of course, for FCIP, but especially in the sense that FCIP is oftentimes viewed as a faraway body, you know, and that like, oh, they're in, they're in Kansas, you know, they're in the Wizard of Oz, you know, we don't see those people ever. Um, and so by really kind of involving FCIP in terms of specifically how we're teaching step classes and how we're teaching laboratory classes and kind of taking the emphasis off of a lecture and putting it more towards lab in terms of how we're doing things um, and really giving faculty the tools needed, conceptually the tools needed to tackle how we approach laboratory courses um, is a huge area for FCIP to continue looking at. Um, and I would really like to see um, the ways in which you guys continue to do so. 
Well, great. Thank you so much. If there are no other uh, questions, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up for us today. Um, so thank you so much, Dakota, for uh, this presentation, but also just the work that you've done uh, this semester uh, as, as a mentor, as an advisor, as a friend. I'm very, very proud of you and proud of all of this uh, work that you have done. Um, and everything that you will continue to do from this point on. Uh, it's been a joy to work with you. Um, as Dakota, um, as uh, Dakota uh, gestured toward in her presentation, uh, you can see, you'll be able to see over the summer a bit of a write-up um, along with this particular, um, this recording, but a bit of a more formal write-up of what um, uh, this presentation that Dakota was talking about, along with how we in FCIP intend to use it in the different ways. Um, that'll be a lot of the, for example, to what Bridget mentioned too, there are a lot of ways that we at FCIP can employ this information, right? We can employ it in thinking about preparing our own faculty scholars, we employed in thinking about what are workshops, what are lectures, what are different things that we can do, what are partnerships, maybe with step uh, the step program and with uh, the School of Environmental Sustainability that we can work on to even further this kind of thing. So be on the lookout for that, and we'll keep everyone updated um, with that information. So again, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank you for your participation. I know we had some people jump off, but this has been a really wonderful uh, crowd. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Take care.